since Dungeons and Dragons is all the rage on the internet right now, we should do a celebratory episode. So for today's topic, let's get into the dragons of Cube. Sounds good. So I guess we can kind of like section our talk about dragons into like the was kind of thing like these were the cool ones let's section off the dragons into a couple categories here we'll start off with like some golden oldies things that you can't really argue in cube anymore unless you're doing like a certain theme or whatever but at one point in time i know i loved playing them and i assume a lot of our other audience did too yeah but let's start things off with eternal dragon Yeah, I am a huge fan of Eternal Dragon. I used to absolutely love the ability of, like, you plane cycle it. So, like, early game, you're not like, I'm sitting with this dumb dragon in my hand and can't do anything. And it also wasn't just, like, a nothing because it could come back from the graveyard. It was just one of those, like, really cool dirtle engines that's a cool dragon. It unfortunately suffered from a critical flaw, though. It was a 7-drop 5-5 flyer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's not really castable unless you're just stalling the game so much. And in the Miracle case where it is castable, it's pretty bad. Yeah. (laughs) You're not usually sweating when your opponent taps 7 mana and drops down a 5-5 flyer and you're like, where's the rest of it? Yeah, anything else would have been scary, but like, I could probably deal with this. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's still cool, and I have fond memories of it, but it's seen its age. It's kind of been specifically power crept by Timeless Dragon, which we'll get to later. Right. So it was great for its time. I'm sure there are certain people who are going to be arguing to us that it's still great today and we should try it again, but no. No. (laughs) No, I'm sorry. It was very cool. And maybe there's like a, I'm building an oldies cube. Okay. Yeah. Have your museum. It'll be great. Speaking of things that can go in that museum. Indiana Jones is getting a sequel. Oh, also Kaiga the Tide Star. (laughs) Yeah, it's tough. I was never really a huge fan of Kaiga, honestly, even though I knew it was strong for a while. I kind of was. I really remember liking it before my cube was built when I used to play on the MTGO cube with our cube guild. Yeah. But that was (laughs) prehistory. (laughs) Yeah. It was a long time ago. Kaiga was a long time ago. But you got to look at how far Blue Six Drops have come since then. Like that's the true. whole 5-5 five, five flyer. And then it's got a death trigger that's a mind control. Is like, that's that's pretty cute. Could we put this down to Uncommon now? Probably not because it's got any type of mind control and they hate that at Uncommon. But... Probably. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Like For a long time, blue finishers were like not good (laughs) like you had to go into other things or just keep grinding them and i mean a 5-5 flyer that has additional stuff for six and blue was legit and as we keep moving on in the old stuff the next couple sting a little closer to home for you and i yeah we have steel hellkite and molten steel dragon steel hellkite being the colorless six drop with two awful abilities that you always thought were going to be better than they were. Yeah, I mean, they were occasionally relevant, (laughs) enough to not be, like, complete nothings, but... This came out in the same set as Worm Coil Engine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And Mirror Battle Sphere. It was still, like, one of the better options, but it was, like, (laughs) the better options of in comparison kind of thing, because Colorless higher drops were either like cute and funny or you know the busto worm coil i think part of it is hellkite comes at that era at like scars of mirrodin where this is like the titan worm coil six drops can be good now era yeah and so a lot of people looked at it from historical six drop standpoints and went this thing's gotta be great and then it just wasn't. <laughs> it was fine. And Magic had moved on by the time this was rolling out. It kind of had. This probably would have been great five years earlier. It still has a, a special spot in like EDH, in my opinion, 
but yeah, it kind of was a bit late. And like Molten Steel Dragon, dude, I love that card. Dude, it's a colorless four drop four four flyer with fire breathing for two life. Yeah, and it just hurts a lot. And like it was never really good. <laughs> we kind of forced it to be good, but it wasn't really there. And as one last thing from that Scars era, we've got the one that wasn't really in my cube ever, but it's warm close to our hearts, which is Skittles, Skitherix, the Blight Blight Dragon. Dragon. Yeah, it's just one of those, like, anytime Infect is brought into a limited environment, be it cube or, you know, actual drafts kind of thing, it's either oppressive or not useful, (laughs) essentially. The main problem was... It's a mechanic where you would have to have so many bad cards in order to get the density high enough with just how the mechanic functioned. And playing with a second life count means that they're useless when you stop having infect creatures in play. The thing that set Skittles apart was she comes in and does 4 out of 10 on every swing. Yeah. And has the regeneration. Could come down hasty for an extra mana. It is actually a surprising roadblock if, like, that's what you needed. That's also true. Yeah. But it, the the play patterns were generally problematic for just play. Yeah, there's a reason we never really did it. Yeah. It's a cool card, though. Like, still really like the card, and the art's still cool. <laughs> but I think we can move on to some of the the actual, like, big, never-casting, dumb dragons. <laughs> <laughs> the first one I'd argue is Caspel. The problem was just it was so vanilla, which is Broodmate Dragon. When we get into the Jund section here, you had the classic Jund card. A 4-4 flyer that makes a 4-4 flyer when it enters. So you get 8 whole flying power for a whopping 6 mana. Yeah. You're like, wow, this is so above rate. Except you're in 3 colors. So... I know that a lot of people did play it, and I think that's just because, like, people were trying to force a Jund card, and, you know, like, it was like, oh, every section needs to have a card, because that was our rationale of, like, it's the one for Jund. Good enough. (laughs) I specifically remember playing this because I remember when I changed over to the next card we're talking about instead, and the argument we had was, this card doesn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Broodmate just didn't do anything. So, Hellkite Overlord... (laughs) <laughs> if, if you don't do anything, it's not that big of a downgrade from <laughs> Broodmate. <laughs> but the upside, dude, the upside yeah. is a massive 8-8 flying trample. This was brought in basically just as a trick, like a yeah. uh, something to show and tell or sneak attack, whatever. Yeah, reanimate. Like any way of cheating it into play. Because flying trample haste 8-8, that can do a lot. Uh, but it's definitely uncastable at 8 mana and Jund. <laughs> yeah, I... It was cute for its time, but we've moved long past those days. In a similar vein, Bogarden, 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 however you're supposed to say that word, Hellkite, was cool. (laughs) I don't know, man. It was like, it was nice because it was red and it's nice to have those like a cheat target that's big in red for the sneak attack. I remember this being a thing when we first started my cube. Yeah. And it was still, like, kind of not arguable back then. I think it's because, like, the Dragonstorm thing was, like, two years before then, so it was still kind of hot in people's minds right. of, like, oh, man, Ogred and Hellkite has been good before. What if it's good in my cube because I have ways I can cheat it in? It's just not good enough. Exactly. It Yeah, it basically was just not good enough, but we played with that for a long time, actually. It was, like, a couple I, years. I don't remember playing it that long. It was a couple years. It just was never played yeah well there's that (laughs) it was in it was technically in the cube for a couple years sure (laughs) but before we move on out of the oldies we can't without mentioning coco show anthony shout out to you for probably still playing it (laughs) (laughs) all right let's let's move on from the uh museum into our next honorable mention category for dragons. The, these aren't even dragons. But they should be. (laughs) 
This is the shout out for two of our homies, Sark and the Master List, who turns all of your planeswalkers into dragons. Yeah, and makes dragons as well. And it's just like, why don't we just have dragon as part of his typing? To be honest, Sarkin is like one of my favorite dragons in air quotes, which is why I made this section. Yeah. Huge fan of this card. It's one of those that like when we were thinking of the original topic of like five drop dragons, it was like yeah, Sarkin, yeah. obviously, like... Yeah, he's a planeswalker, technically not a dragon, but like, <laughs> well, read the card and he does dragony things. So, and yeah, I mean, we couldn't get away with this list without mentioning the dragon god. Yeah, so Nicobolas in general, any of his iterations should count in this because he is an elder dragon. But yeah, dragon god being the one that we currently love and probably will run for far too long, but I love him. Yeah, it's, it is actually a good card, and it's fun, which is one of the best things about dragons, is that, like, when you can get a good card that's also a dragon, it just feels more special. It's like, I don't know, it's it's an inner kid of, like, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Look at what I'm playing. All right, and all of the stupid stuff is out of the way now. We are now officially into Dragonland, where... I'm not going to say all of these are run in every modern cube, but they are more modern to the point where you don't really think of these as that weird. The worst ones on this list, you'd be like, oh, maybe it's a budget option or, oh, maybe they just have this as a pet card, but you wouldn't really think of it as weird. It wouldn't be like, oh, they haven't updated their cube in eight years. All right. So let's get into it with the non-red ones. So... Murktide Regent is... Technically a dragon. Technically a dragon and just, like, stupid It is efficient. not an insect wizard. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're not wrong on that one. Uh, yeah, just a stupid efficient card and disappointingly doesn't feel like a dragon because, like, you look at it and you're like, it's a 3-3. Three, three. Cool. Well... I mean, calling it a 3-3 is kind of disingenuous. I agree, but, like, you know, it's one of those that, like, I look at a dragon card and, like, looking at the card is like, wow, it's a big dragon. And then I look at the box and it's, like, 3-3. And it's like, oh, well, that's disappointing. I mean, yeah, it gets bigger because of plus and plus encounters and stuff. But, like, I don't know. It's disappointing. (laughs) But, yeah, just, like, really efficiently good. Yeah, it's almost as good as the next blue card. Ah, yeah, you and your... (laughs) (sighs) so we have shimmer dragon because you knew i wasn't getting out of this episode without mentioning it no yeah i mean it's i don't hate the card i love shimmer dragon but i'm i'm not stupid enough to mention it being better than merc tide seriously (laughs) (laughs) yeah shimmer dragon's like legitimately pretty cool with the artifacts deck and reasonably fine even like just general cubes if you're more of a budget kind of thing. But if we have to pick one of the two blue dragons, we're picking Murktide here. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> anyway. So. As we talked about previously with Eternal Dragon. Timeless Dragon. That's just, it's just better. Like, <laughs> it's just better. And being a five drop five five with flying is castable and reasonable. Yeah, it's just... It flows better as a split card in air quotes, whereas Eternal Dragon kind of doesn't. Because you either have the 5-5 flyer for 5, that then ends up as an Eternalized body. Or... Or you end up with the plane cycling into an Eternalized body so that you still get more value out of that. Yeah. It just... Honestly, like, it's just a solid play pattern no matter what what state of the game you're in. There's no, like, oh, I have to do this or I'm going to die. Or, oh... I have to draw this board wipe or I'm going to die. It's like, no, Timeless Dragon's going to hit the points on the curve that you need it to do, and it's going to be good. So I think it still loses points for me just because it's not flashy or fun. It, it's a yeah. utilitarian card. Yes. It's not the, like, wow, that was a dragon. It's, okay, it did this thing. <laughs> Efficient multiple things toolkit card. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. All right, and then into black, we've got two quick mentions here. The first one being the better of the two, in my opinion. <laughs> I think so, yeah. First up is one of the only D&D cards that I don't despise. Ebon Death Draco Lich. 
is pretty cool still. I, I think it was just wildly undervalued because we have so many options. Yes. I'm not saying it's wrong. The thing that's tough is because it's ETBs tapped, it's tough to like think of like, oh, it's always going to do what I want kind of thing. Like there's going to be that lag period of Yeah, but it has flash uh, like Yeah. Yeah. I I mean I'm with you. I think I think Evan Death's a solidly good card. And it is an interesting card as well. It's a great bridge card between between like an aggressive aristocrats and like a mid rangey stacks. Yeah. It rides that line. And I like that it's bridging those. And it's solid in both of them and like it works well in that whole thing. And just like five power flying with flash is it's gotta be respected kind of thing. So And again, having two toughness isn't that big of a downside with it because no. as long as it's getting trade value in, it's just gonna come back. It's that is mana taxing you when it does it. And time taxing you because as you mentioned, the entering tapped while it has to be there for balance purposes, yes. It causes awkwardness. But I still think if you're like a newer cube, Evan Death is still like a great early pickup that maybe doesn't last the test of time. But I want to say it should be cheap, but I'm not going to look was, it up and be depressed today. That's the thing is like I it's tough to default back to like the oh, it's on there for budget reasons, because like any dragon has the possibility of being expensive just randomly because yep. it wasn't, you know, it was printed in a low set or it wasn't reprinted. And it's like and like people like dragons. So it's tough, but I'm pretty sure the next one bone dragon is cheap. I we used this in the budget cube for a while. I think I actually took it out because I was running it only in I want to say the starter cube and it hit like a dollar and I was like, yeah, it was fun while it lasted, but it's not good enough to be a dollar. Yeah. And I think since then, it's actually dropped back down a little bit again. But either way, like it's not an expensive <laughs> dragon. At the same time, I'd argue it's not a good dragon. The only reason it survived this is because of the budget cubes yes. and us like knowing the card. And having tested it, even though we wouldn't really play it in our main cube. No, seven cards for the exile to like bring it back just means it only happens once. Or zero. Right, yeah, which not particularly great, but it's still... It's crazy this was a mythic. It is, yeah. I mean, it was an M set. M19 was a good set, though. Like, legitimately great set. Yeah. It's just weird. But I, I still think Bone Dragon's cool, and it has potential in some of the more budget area ones. All right, we're done with the non-red ones, Eric. You know what that means. That means multicolor. Okay. Yeah. But we can talk about some red kind of cards. They just have other colors as well. <laughs> All of these are red except for the best one. I don't know about that. All right, we can start off with one of the cutest dragons, and that's Sprite Dragon. I will not argue this point. He is adorable. I legitimately really like Sprite Dragon in, like, any cube. I wholly agree. And it's crazy because it's, like, it's a little uncommon. Very unassuming. Yeah. But, like, it's flying haste and it's going to get that damage in, man. <laughs> Sprite Dragon kills people. It does. It really does. It's really mean to put the card that's next to it next to it. Cause... Yeah. You go from the, the cute is it little dragon to the uh, granddaddy is it dragon. And then we tripled the cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Niv Mizzet Perun, my favorite Niv Mizzet. One that I argue is still quite cubable. It is more of a toy than an all-star. Yeah. But you'll be shocked at how much you like it. Uh, highly recommend still trying to force him in there on occasion. But yeah, Spray Dragon is is technically much better than niv mizzet but i don't care one of the interesting and great things about niv mizzet perun is it really warps the draft around it like once you pick that up you're like this is what i'm doing yeah and it can warp not just your instant and sorceries yeah but it can warp you into draw what and... types of instant and sorceries yeah. and what cost instant and sorceries you want to play and it's shockingly castable because it is. in is it you go so deep so hard yeah well especially because like you're going to be grabbing those draw card instance and sorceries like it's because it's just going to work well together and like you know it's not a stable by any stretch or anything like that but it's 
a solid card still nowadays, and it's very interesting. It feels very multicolor dragon kind of thing. Yes. And if you're looking for something to, like, spice things up, throw it in there. Give Niv a test, and he will make your drafters happy. Yeah. People get happy playing against Niv or playing with him, drafting him. Just generally good for gameplay. It is actually really fun to play against. Like, you don't feel bad about losing to Niv, Miz, or Perun just because, like, they cast a six drop that's blue, 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 red, red, red. <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing cool stuff. I can't feel bad about that. And it's not like he's unanswerable, which is why he's not busted. Turns good cards great. Turns great cards amazing. Really fun. I love Niv. Yeah. Second favorite card in this section for me. I was like, you probably love this next one a little bit more. After my my all-star, my favorite boy, Dragonlord Silumgar. A card I am overly attached to. You gonna steal your wife? Mr. Steal Your Wife. Uh, <laughs> I have a Silumgar Steals Your Shit EDH deck. Stupid EDH deck. <laughs> which is a, a deck with no win conditions other than hit you with a 3-5 dragon or steal your shit and hit you with it. Stop hitting yourself, idiot. So uh, we have so many good Demir options that it doesn't... That's the problem. Honestly, like, Dragonlord Silumgar is great, but, like... It annoys me because he could still be playable. Oh, yeah. If it wasn't for Demir being, like, the best guild. Yeah, he would be completely defensible. And I could still see people playing it for, like, the this is my pet card. Yeah. And, like, it's going to be fine. It's just Demir has 20 other cards that are probably objectively better. Yeah, depending on how you want to slant your section. Yeah. Like, there's all sorts of different ways you can take Demir. So it's tough, but Dragonlord Silmgar is really cool. If you're, like, bored with Demir... Please play him. <laughs> yeah. I promise you he is so fun. Definitely. We've got another Dragon Lord, Dragon Lord Atarka. This is a very big dragon. <laughs> Atarka lasted a long time in our cube. We removed her at some point because of uh Dracuset, essentially. Yeah, we had done some changing around. Yeah. It was one of those where it was like, we can get rid of it because we have she is a, back a again, red though. backup option. Yes, but then she did return, and she's still in my cube today. Yeah, uh, it's not surprising. I'm not saying she's an all-star of Gruul, but she is within that top tier where you can pick what you want, basically, depending on what you need. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those, like, it's the cheat target. Like, you're not really casting it. Eh, I guess it... It's somewhat castable in Gruul. That's the problem. Like, I have cast her. I don't usually put her in the deck assuming I'm right. going to be hard casting her. I'm usually doing something, like I'm playing a sneak and show deck or something. Yeah. You know, like rug cheat into play stuff. Yeah, it just like happens that like you manage to get through the game long enough with ramp, normal ramp stuff, and like your previous targets didn't really get it there. So eventually you just keep building up until you're able to cast Dragonlord Atarka and usually win the game then. <laughs> Definitely a fun cheat target. I think she hits that perfect middle ground between the last two Jund ones we talked about in Overlord. Yeah. Where she's a color less, which is an instant win. <laughs> Helps a lot. For one more mana than Broodmate and easier color cost, you get a way better dragon. Yeah. And upgrading a whole mana and color to get Overlord Yikes. feels awful by comparison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this only came out like, uh, was it five, six years after the other two? I want to say five or six. I'm not going to look it up because I'll be sad. I don't know, dude. It was more than two, less than 20. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> All right. So speaking of Jund, though. Yeah, dude. Korvald, Fakehurst King is so cool. It's still probably my favorite Jund card. Korvald is just cool. He enters and like just fucks your opponent up. <laughs> <laughs> like i don't know dude i just it's a fun card it just really is fun and it's tough because like three color his problem is he is both three color and can be hard to play with or play around or build your deck around however you want to think of it yeah it's one of those that like amazing in theory of like oh i'm gonna craft this constructed deck around it and it's like that's cool as shit man a little bit more difficult to do all of that in 
draft when it's also like a three color so like you're committing a lot during the draft to make that happen speaking of a lot of colors and committing a lot yeah we have my new favorite toy that probably not worth but screw it two-headed hell kite yeah for those of you wondering what i just mentioned i will actually read this one because it's new and a little niche but we liked it on hot takes one white blue black red green for a five five dragon with flying menace and haste Whenever it attacks, draw two cards. That simple. It is simple. It's clean. It's efficient. It's five colors. <laughs> yeah. And is it worth going five colors to try naturally casting it? No. But it's really fun when you cheat it in. But then the argument becomes, if you're just bringing it in as a cheat target, why not go bigger and go dumber? Yeah. Go bigger and go dumber. I like that because it's true. You know, if you're going to cheat, in to play that kind of stuff you can cheat in things that like legitimately win the game instead of does some damage and gives you a couple cards i just i love this card on so many little levels and i just want to say like you could do like a five color good stuff control with this card and it would be castable oh yeah i think it's not worth that corner case over just going bigger and dumber for the general use case but and I want to believe one of the problems there is like even if you're doing the five color control E, five color good stuff, whatever, you probably have more efficient, more generally useful and castable cards in your deck than a five color. Like you're just taking like the best color, the best cards in any color kind of thing instead of a five color card. But it is nice to have an option of a five color dragon. And this one is cool. All right. I think. We can finally get into the red ones. All right, so I'll start us off with the most obvious red dragon. Phyrexian Dragon Engine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He has an unearthed cost that's red. Yeah, technically. And it's also kind of weird because like a three drop, two, two dragon. (laughs) I guess it's got double strike. It's double strike. It's double strike. Yeah, yeah, I it's just yeah it doesn't really fit in what i would expect out of a red dragon but no fair and enough because it's not fighting the other ones i like it more yeah it does have an unearth cost of five though which maybe it's a five drop dragon in a weird way yeah and like three drops in red the unearth trigger's good it's not that it's like a great trigger but it's like it is a nice icing on the cake yeah. when you unearth it to get the effect that you are probably wanting when you do the unearth that is the thing is one of those like if you're doing the unearth it's usually right that you want that thing to happen you want more cards because you're kind of like you're it's one of those where it's like i've got nothing to play you're out of resources go to the graveyard is there anything useful and you're like oh this card is useful now (laughs) and then you just get three extra cards in hand yeah why not because the ones in your hand clearly weren't casting over it. Yeah. It is neat and it's solid, but like not really dragony in my opinion. You want to know it's dragony? Dracuseth Maw of Flames. I love this man. Dude, Dracuseth is so cool. <laughs> I love the fact that we have this like good and efficient red cheat target. Like that's just red. Yes. It was like such a good budget reanimator target. Like we're talking like. Almost normal cube, cube worthy without question when it came out. Yeah. It was like just on the edge of playable there. And then it had like a 45 cent cost attached to it. So I was thrilled to be able to cube this. And I liked it in our main cube okay. It had way more longevity in the budget cubes as intro level. Hey, do you like cheating stuff like this in? You can go in this direction. I do think that there is still room for Dracoseth in cubes, like generally, but you know, it's one of those that, yeah, it's, it's got competition and it's got, you know, one of those, like if you're cheating stuff, you can just get like, you don't have to have red kind of thing. You can just cheat other dumb things, (laughs) but I really do like Dracoseth and it did really well in our budget cubes and it was solid in the main cube let's talk about the two questionable ones i wanted to put these in the golden oldies but they're not worthy yeah thunderbreak regent and i guess storm breath dragon are i've seen people play them and they're not bad that's the 
best thing I can say about them. Honestly, they're not bad. They're fine. But to me, the other options are more interesting and better. And there's enough other options that it's like, I don't need these two. (laughs) Yeah. My problem is they're so vanilla. So vanilla. What are you talking about? Look at all those words on Storm Breath Dragon, Brad. Yeah, exactly. Look at all those words on Storm Breath Dragon. (laughs) (laughs) It has protection from white. Because of reasons. I'm sure someone will remind me that in Theros that was important, but I don't fucking remember. Yeah, I think it vaguely did have a reason of like they were worried about something in Standard. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, both Thunderbreak region and Storm Breath Dragon are fine cards. But I've got better ones like Atsushi blazing sky so honestly just like <laughs> dumb efficiently good it doesn't overwhelm me in any way but it's good yeah and a sushi's a four drop four four flying trample the death trigger is like that's cute it's nice it's okay but just being a four drop four four flying trample is good enough yeah so like comparing it to thunderbreak region obvious comparison right here right you've gained trample on your vanilla spectrum because they're both pretty vanilla which is nice, especially because flying tokens are fairly common in cube. And you trade out, if it dies to targeted removal, bolt a player. To, if it dies at all, do one of two decent things that are probably both, I want to say better than a bolt, but I know you're a burn player. It's tough. I mean, Thunderbreak Regent works better if you're in, like, the, like, combo aspect of burn kind of thing where it's just like i'm counting to 20 yeah okay sure in that specific deck but i'd still rather in the whole cube rather have a sushi taking a slot yeah because just having the ability to have those treasure tokens will be nice the draw two cards in like red's weird way can be quite useful it's just atsushi works better but it's also tough because like we're talking about all the dragons i'm not excited by that as a dragon (laughs) maybe it's just me it's true it doesn't hit that inner child oh my god it's a dragon height no it's better than the thundering raiju i'm testing right now though i can tell you that much (laughs) anyway speaking about five drop dragons though it's time for the big royal rumble hell in a cell cage match four-way brawl that is the final four contestants in this episode yeah i think there's crowd favorites here oh there definitely are i think one of them is an underdog that we're just mentioning there definitely are crowd favorites but let's just name them we've built up to this for the entire episode essentially in this corner (laughs) we've started off with the underdog the little dragon who couldn't terror of the peaks It comes in at a whopping 5-4, sporting the highest power, tied with the champion. Yeah. (laughs) You gonna keep going? And that's about it. (laughs) And then we've got Goldspan Dragon, coming out of a hot standard environment or whatever, because I'm pretty sure this thing was like $35. I have no idea. I'm pretty sure this card was stupid expensive because of standard. Goldspan Dragon is a little bit leaner at 4-4, but it comes with that beautiful haste. And everyone's least favorite mechanic, Treasure. Treasure's cool, man. (laughs) I'm pretty sure this is one of the cards that made everyone sick of Treasure. It might have been. It came in for 5 mana. You instantly swing with it, you make a Treasure, and all your Treasures tap for 2 mana, so it was like 5 mana that's instantly 3 Yeah. by the time you're swinging. Which is kind of why it's good. (laughs) (laughs) but yeah it was one of those that like it came off of a bunch of other treasure stuff that was happening like watsy just felt like they were just giving out treasures to things at least that's how it felt it really did and treasures make sense with dragons it's more excusable than a lot of other places treasures ended up yes but it felt like it fell under the banner of i don't know just give it some fucking treasure tokens in a vacuum i like a gold span dragon and i'm like treasures make sense this has like interesting lore kind of stuff to it of like yeah it's a dragon it has treasures and they're good (laughs) but when you read it in the context of 2020 or later magic you're just like oh look treasure tokens yeah it's like a five drop dragon what did they do special with it this time oh 
treasures. The right. current hot mechanic. They just added it to the dragon. Roll my eyes. Yeah. So tough on that one. But like, honestly, Gold Span Dragon is good. <laughs> it is. And then we've got the two main contestants. Everyone knows them and loves them. We have Glory Bringer. <laughs> and the current reigning champ, Thunder Maw. Yeah. Kind of technically, we've also got Sark on the master list. But <laughs> uh, Yeah. He's in his own category. He's, he's he's not part of this. Yeah, we've already talked. But <laughs> yeah, Glorybringer and Thunder Maw Hellkite are like what comes to mind when you're like dragons and cube, at least to me. They were the original idea when we were spitballing ideas with the patrons of I am on team Glorybringer with a good chunk of the patrons on I would rather if I had to cut down to a single five drop dragon, I'm choosing Glorybringer. And we found out Eric... I would choose Thunder Maw Hellkite, but... Eric has no soul and would just choose the strictly better boring card that doesn't go boom when it enters the battlefield. Yeah, it goes crackle crackle instead. <laughs> like, that's the noise of lightning. That's exactly the noise lightning makes, crackle crackle. <laughs> <laughs> Snap and Pop couldn't make it to the lightning convention. <laughs> No, they're running a bit late. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those, like you said, like, I think Thunder Maw Hellkite is in, like, the vacuum. It does the job better. But I accept that, like, that hyper aggro five drop finisher doesn't have to be that. It could be Glory Bringer. It would still do the job really well. And it would also have a bit more play to it. Plus, have you ever just played your Glory Bringer sideways, going, playing this, attacking you? dealing for to that yeah 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 yeah. i had that in the uh, oh it's so pre-release for that set i know you did you son of a bitch i know you did fuck you it was it was glorious <laughs> some of us were trying <laughs> to make things work and eric's like yo foil glory bringer <laughs> that thing's dead <laughs> oh yeah take four <laughs> fly idiot <laughs> i have way more positive memory of games using Glorybringer than I've ever felt for Thunder Maw, no matter how strictly good the card is. And that's fair, I think. But it is one of those where, like, you have to give credit where credit is due. Thunder Maw Hellkite is insanely powerful. Yes. If your opponent's just playing some walkers that are making spirits or birds or whatever the hell is getting in your way, yeah. Thunder Maw is unstoppable way to finish games. Out of the four, Terror of the Peaks is the worst one pretty easily. But... I like Terror of the Peak still. It's got that stupid thunder break region safety net of at least you're getting a bolt when they target it with removal. And it's got that really fun pandemonium effect attached to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's fun. <laughs> I, I It's know, a cool effect you don't see often. I, yeah, I know you built an EDH deck around that kind of fun. So we we might have a differing opinion on that. Don't put it in air quotes. I can hear over the airwaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Terror of the Peaks, I agree with you. I think it's the weakest of these four, but it's it still is. respectable enough to be talked about in the same sentence <laughs> of these others. Yeah, but I think I'm to the point where, like, Glorybringer plus Goldspan is more fun than Glorybringer plus Thundermaw. Although, I don't know. I am that way. I like I said I I think I can accept that because Glorybringer and Goldspan are not that far off from Thunder Maw Hellkite and they do more interesting things outside of the one note of kill your opponent <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is like there are other like five drop things like this that are kind of interesting. So like you only have so many slots. I mean yeah. Right now in my cube, the only one of these we're running is Glorybringer. Because I had to cut one of them. I cut Thunder Maul. This is how this all started right, long ago. Yeah. And then the whole question of which one do you cut came up, blah, blah, blah. But I think if I were to go back to two dragons in the five slot, I'd go with Goldspan coming back. Well, coming for the first time. But I'd go with Goldspan. Yeah, I was like, I'd be okay with testing Goldspan. I mean, I think it's amazing and it's it's done decent work for others. <laughs> So I don't think we'd be disappointed with it. Eric, out of morbid curiosity, I checked the price of Goldspan Dragon. Yeah, it's $3.80. No, it's not as bad as I thought. It's only like $13. 
that's not actually like the worst for a mythic dragon that's solidly good good so you're fine if i ask you to borrow 13 bucks then oh, fuck no <laughs> <laughs> just put thunder Maw back in what the fuck's wrong with you? <laughs> and that sums up this argument okay? <laughs> Have you lost your I don't mind? Know how else to end this segment? That was perfect. Thank you for coming to our very thematic episode. Hopefully, nothing else goes terribly wrong with wizards and dungeons. Oh, hang on, I've got a me- yeah. Hang I... on, I've got a notification on my phone here. Oh no! Let's let's just get out of here. <laughs>